Mr. Boss. I think he and I agree that you should start again. So okay. We don't agree about who's the boss, but <laughs> you should start. Great. Uh, thank you very much for staying till the end. Um, today I would like to talk about expectations formation. My name is Yurema. I'm based in Chicago Booth. So by expectations, we mean how people form beliefs about uncertain outcomes in the future. And that's quite prevalent in our day-to-day -day life for many economic decisions. In fact, when I first arrived, um, I heard the boss um, asking a wise man um, about investments in financial securities, which um, type of uh, financial security he should invest in, and in particular, what are the expectations of returns of different types of stocks, different investment um, alternatives in the future. So you see that this happens a lot in life, and it's an important um, subject for economics. And there are different paths for modeling expectations, and which path that we may want to go down and want to pursue um, I think depends a lot on the data. So today I will start by outlining some of the um, consistent features in, in the data that we have learned over the past few years, and then some modeling effort inspired by the features that people see in the data, and then some um, implications for thinking about various features of expectations. So um, Jerusalem is a place with enormous history, and on the subject of expectations, there is also an um, interesting intellectual history. So for me, this is mostly secondhand reading, and Eric and Jose may know much more about the intellectual development on topics um, of expectations. So uh, people recognize that expectations are central to economic analysis since very early on. And in the, for example, in the middle of the 20th century, there used to be extensive effort to collect data on actual expectations. Um, for example, there's a very nice NBR volume still on NBR's website led by Franco Moliani called the quality and economic significance of anticipations data. The idea at the time is we want to understand how firms invest, how they make decisions, and um, it's probably very important that we should go and ask for managers how they think about the future and, and to help us understand why they do what they do. And then since the 1970s, economics has been pretty substantially influenced by the rational expectations revolution. Um, initially, I think a lot of the pursuit is to try to pin down expectations in a way that's consistent with the model. Um, but not necessarily taking it literally as a description of every single thing in reality. For example, um, Zhang Muth actually, um, after he proposed the idea and the concept of rational expectations, he did survey at least five Pittsburgh area firms to try to understand where their actual forecasts and projections conform with rational expectations. And um, he found that that didn't happen. So he was actually pretty relaxed about rational expectations as mostly a theoretical construct, very useful for many analysis, but not necessarily uh, an empirical statement. There's another side to that, which is that, in fact, the data on anticipations kind of help the rational expectation revolution to occur, because one of the things that people figure out is that these anticipations data seem to predict, they were different, they predicted better than the kind of time series analysis that people used to do just mm -hmm. regression. Yep. So the data of anticipation was used very early on mm -hmm. to think about whether right. one should think of agencies kind of knowing a little bit about one, not being perfect like the rest of the to think about. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So in the second half of today, um, a large part of what I'm going to discuss is the usefulness of expectations data for explaining behavior above and beyond some of the traditional measures from models. Um, however, I think one after a while, as rational expectations took hold, there was some form of a view that now, because we think of expectations as pinned down by the model, then data is sort of irrelevant. So it started from expectations being very useful for describing behavior to a point where um, we adhere very strictly to the model and therefore data um, is not uh, the primary source of information anymore. Um, I guess Prescott wrote some pretty like strong words about the irrelevance of data and expectations. Um, 
So in recent years, especially after the financial crisis, there's a revival of the study of um, expectations from an empirical perspective. And a lot of the motivation came from the fact that there were many empirical regularities that we saw in the credit cycle in the financial crisis, the large swings in beliefs or the large swings in outcomes and uh, apparent swings in beliefs that are hard to explain based on traditional paradigms. And um, investigating the role of beliefs in the Boomba cycle opens up many interesting research fronts. So over the past, I guess by now, um, more than 10 years, there's a lot of effort in collecting data on expectations to understand the empirical features. And we've learned that first, expectations can be meaningfully elicited and measured in the data as Al Hanan so when he asked the, the wise men the expectations of stock returns, the wise men said on bank stocks is eight to nine percent. So people have meaningful uh, expectations of many economic outcomes. If you ask them, they can they can tell you how they think. So it can be measured by the data. And second, as Jose already mentioned, that expectations are very important for explaining economic decisions and behavior. And third. Um, now we want to understand what are the features of expectations in the data and in many contexts we see that there are systematic deviations in expectations from rational benchmarks. For example, for the case of stock returns, we'll show a lot of um, evidence of that. And this um, effort has covered <coughs> a number of topics including financial markets, stock returns, bond yields, credit spreads, as well as standard macroeconomic outcomes, inflation and GDP, um, corporate decisions, earnings and investment, and household expectations of house prices and income. Um, I will show some examples of the results from all um, these domains. So ultimately, the research program on expectations tries to um, proceed in the following steps. First is to understand uh, and analyze expectations in the data and second, guided by the data, develop some um, psychologically founded portable models of beliefs and their multiple um, ways and uh, ideas for doing this. I will show some examples today and um, also uh, explain some potential room for improvement in this um, step. And then finally, once we have some of these models, we want to incorporate them in uh, macro finance analyses to help understand uh, the role of belief fluctuations in driving business cycles, investment cycles, credit cycles, and so on. And there are many interesting open questions at this step um, today. Yes? Is there, um, is there some interest in a possible feedback loop between uh, acquiring and publicizing data on expectations and, uh, and the performance of the economy. Uh, what I'm thinking of is uh -huh. uh, you know, occasionally, fr from time to time, they publish the consumer confidence right. uh, index. And, that, and this is sometimes a surprise. Yeah. And the stock market reacts to mm -hmm. it. So, so, so the very act of, of gathering data and publicizing mm -hmm. data can have an effect on the economy itself. I don't know that that whether that's studied in the mm -hmm. in the uh, in the literature. Yeah, that's a super interesting point. I think one form of that, for example, is the Fed tries to guide behavior by guiding expectations, and sometimes it's um, announcement of their policy actions. Sometimes it's announcement of information they have collected. Um, and there's some work that shows so-called Fed information effect, which is the financial markets do interpret Fed announcements not just about not just as an indication of what they want to do, but also the Fed may have more um, advanced information right. for what the economy, the trajectory of the economy. And there's some work on that, but the full feedback loop of um, collecting information and then those information affecting other people's behavior and then that feedback to expectations and, and so on. Um, I'm not sure that has been fully um, studied in the, the entire circle. Um, 
some segments of that have been studied. For example, how professional forecasters' in, um, expectations may affect household expectations, mm -hmm. how Fed expectations may affect market expectations. But rounding the entire circle, not something that I can think about on the spot. If I think about something, I, I will uh, mention later. So the plan for today is the first half of the lecture. The first lecture is going to focus on um, the data, the empirical structures that we see in the data, and then one model that tries to capture some salient aspect of the data, and then there are multi multiple aspects of the data, and I will also try my best to connect to some of the themes that Ben brought up yesterday on whether we see, for example, indications of inattention and sluggishness in, in the data on expectations. And then the second half, the second lecture, is going to try to think about um, first how expectations can help us understand behavior, what drives behavior, how it may help us differentiate different models of behavior. And then the, once we recognize there are some systematic biases and expectations, what are their potential impact, how to evaluate the impact of bias expectations. And finally, I will sketch out some open questions, at least questions that I've thought about and uh, wondered, and I don't think there's a settled answer. Um, yet, and also data sources to think about some potential open questions if you're interested. So let me start with the first part, um, the data on expectations. One of the very important themes in this research program is to synthesize across um, data from different domains and to try to find overarching themes um, in the data that can guide us to de develop um, models to capture expectations in the data. So one um, feature that is uh, often found in many cases through different types of measurement is that people have a tendency to over extrapolate recent shocks for um, recent trends. Um, for example, this morning we need to be reminded that today we start earlier than in the past uh, because we tend to have a tendency to think that what we um, what has been happening uh, tend to persist, maybe more than it actually does. And that's a, some a feature that we see a lot in the data. So by over-extrapolation, where sometimes uh, people also use the term overreaction, um, what we mean is that people um, project too much of recent shocks and trends into so the future. Tomorrow we think that things start at 8. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right? Yes. We had a bad surprise this morning. Right. Hard age. Fortunately, we won't be here. We have this other piece of information that is no school. <laughs> you know, there's the opposite also. In yeah. Science, which psychologists, clinical psychologists, yeah. uh, talk about mm -hmm. hope against experience. Hope against experience? experience. Hope despite experience. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so. Hope th for a change despite an experience of non change. Right. Um, there are that's, that, that belongs yeah. to a different realm. Yeah. There are, there are other um, very interesting questions and beliefs, for example, motivated beliefs, which are probably more related to this phenomenon, that there's something that we hope for and we, we want to believe it's true and we may persuade ourselves that they are true. Uh, that's not so much in what I cover yes. today, but that's another strand of very interesting um, uh, research questions. So I will show some examples of this type of tendency, uh, not in the case of going to school, but in, in, in financial markets and in thinking about macro outcomes and uh, also, for example, in very simple controlled experimental settings. So uh, one of the first results that um, gathered momentum in this um, line of work is by looking at uh, some work that uh, Robin Greenwood and Andre Schleifer did on looking, collecting data on stock market expectations. So that's relevant to Elhanan's um, question. Um, if we ask people what you think about the stock market um, and, and try to understand what drives people's perception of future stock returns, um, then we see a very important um, theme is people's sentiment about future stock market is very correlated with what has been happening, for example, in the past 12 months. Um, here, a lot of the data come from surveys of individual investors and households, and they are often qualitative in nature uh, instead of quantitative. So uh, to understand the structure here, we'll take two steps. One is to see what's the feature of the qualitative data, and then to see their correlation 
um, with what models, um, rational expectations models typically would predict. So again, the measurement here is, for example, we can go to the Gallup survey, which has been asking households their, um, their sentiment about stock market. For example, you, are you optimistic, pessimistic? Um, you can take, for example, the fraction of people who are optimistic minus the fraction of people who are pessimistic. You can plot that against the past 12 months stock returns and you see that these two things are very highly correlated. So when past returns are high, people are optimistic. When past returns are low, people are pessimistic. Then you can ask our standard asset pricing models what's the actual expected returns are at given point in time and then correlate that with the survey expectations. So you can collect survey expectations not just from Gallup but also from, for example, surveys of American um, Association of Individual Investors from Schiller Survey, Michigan Survey, where some uh, um, summary of these um, different surveys, and they're pretty highly correlated. And you can look at how that correlates model um, projections of future um, returns. Um, for example, one proxy that we learn in Finance 101 is uh, a dividend to price ratio, price to dividend ratio. So when dividend relative to uh, price is high, that suggests typically statistically um, future return expected returns would be high and vice versa. Whereas at those points in time, the service will tell you the opposite. When, when the market um, price level, for example, is low relative dividend, the, sub the subjective um, expectations are typically pessimistic as opposed to expecting higher returns going forward. So you see across the board um, generally pretty negative correlations between what people think would happen and what the models um, predict. And then um, in many other domains, you have richer data that are not just qualitative, but also quantitative, and therefore you can calculate the forecast errors. And one of the classic exercises um, is to see whether the forecast errors are predictable. Um, so for example, if you take a look at the forecast errors associated with, say, credit market outcomes at credit spreads, um, we see patterns like, for example, when, and the error is measured as the actual credit spread in the future minus people's projection. And when the current credit spread is low, which is um, this red line, the, the actual f um, outcome in the future tends to be much higher than people's forecast. So when, the, when past credit spread is low, people tend to think that this is going to persist into the future, but what reality, in reality, it's much less so, so actual credit spreads would have a tendency to turn out to be much higher than the projections. So these are data from the blue chip survey of uh, professionals in roughly 40 major financial institutions. And then uh, you, c you can see similar patterns when you look at how CFO's projection of future earnings. For example, um, there's a really wonderful um, set of data collected by the CFO survey run by John Graham and uh, Cam Harvey at Duke University since the late uh, 1990s on a quarterly basis. So they asked the CFOs to um, project their future earnings growth among other things like in investment growth and, and so on. And you can look at the projected earnings growth relative to the actual earnings growth and you see similar patterns that when past profits are high, um, for example, at this point in time, people think that future profits or future earnings growth tend to be high, but in reality, uh, the, in, in those points in time, the realized earnings growth tend to be low, yes. So if you talk about the survey on my election difference in beliefs, because they also talk about, you know, they also give not only the yeah. means, I mean, I, I talk about stock return, yeah. not earnings growth, yeah. but they also give, 1090 yeah. interval, which tends to be too tight. Yeah. I would suspect that I hear they don't do that, right? They yeah, for earnings they, they don't. Yeah. Earnings, and also the earnings realizations for different firms are different, so you can't do the cross check they did for the, for the stock stocks, returns. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's also the, so that's just a, uh, these numbers, so what, this, what is this number called? Is earnings uh, the blue line? That yeah, so the blue what line. Is to, to so the blue line is the realized earnings growth of a firm minus the expected I mean the earnings. Line, the, red yeah. line, yeah. the red line is just 
you know, past uh, 12 months annual earnings over assets. So we're expecting to Oh, that's the blue line is realized minus expected. Yeah, so the, so the, yeah, the blue lines here and here are always forecast errors. So okay. forecast okay. errors are predictable. So the forecast yeah. So forecast errors have a strong, uh, strong predictability. I will come back to the question of um, confidence interval in an in indirect way later, which is, um, as you will see, the current models that capture these um, bias expectations generally um, do not predict overconfidence. Um, however, there's interesting question about biases in the first moments versus biases in, in the tails and second moments. We have much less data overall about the belief of the tails. And that's one of the open questions that I want to discuss, whether there's connections. You, um, you, you might have thought that if the, uh, if the errors, the forecast errors are predictable, that there would be an arbitrage opportunity. If, uh, it, it, is there an arbitrage opportunity? Well, um, first, in the context of corporate earnings, it's not so th these are, th are CFO's biases, and um, how would you capitalize on that? Do they you may really lead to, to trade, uh, to trade you could, you could, with. You could have a security uh -huh. uh, which pays off uh, according to the earnings. Yeah. And, and, if, they, and if, they're, uh, if the CFOs and others are predicting that wrong, yeah. you can. I mean, it wouldn't be an arbitrator, but it would be a, good, a, 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 a high return bet. Well, I, you, you're arbitraging, you're arbitraging the, 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 the You're going to get a high return bet, yeah. In, in, so in the it's going to be a, a high expected yeah. return yeah. bet because uh, well, be right. I guess the, the more um, straightforward context is like, for example, stock market expectations. We're trading against this. It's very straightforward. You don't need to design new securities to, right. to do that. So when you see that, for example, households have pretty optimistic um, beliefs, those are generally good times to trade against them. Yeah. And some people do. And you also see more issuance by firms. Effectively, um, firms are, are taking advantage of the high valuation. Um, however, whether there is sufficient scope for trading to fully eliminate the impact of bias expectations, it sort of connects to the question of limits to arbitrage in behavioral finance for the past few decades, that um, biases can have impact in equilibrium, conditioning on limits to arbitrage, and there's a lot of work on the existence of limits to arbitrage. So um, I think in, in the setting of the um, stock market, for example, shorting, and at the peak of the dot-com boom, it's extremely risky as we Oh no, although firms issuing at that point is slightly less so, but it's, it's not always extremely straightforward to fully counteract it. Um, and so that's another form of measurement, which is you predict forecast errors using some indication of the current status um, uh, of the economy or the object of interest. Another way to capture reaction to information more um, closely, especially in a world, um, for example, in Ben's world, where information is very dispersed, where costly to acquire, then you may not know what is exactly the type of information that people are responding to. So one type of methodology that has been um, gradually adopted in recent years is to capture reaction to information based on forecast revision. So if someone, if a forecaster is revising something, it must be that he has processed certain information. So you use forecast revision as a summary statistic of the information that the forecaster has processed and see whether the forecast revision can predict future forecast errors. So it, yes. Can you talk about expectations of households? Um, of a lot of Household. types of people, households yeah, at the uh, beginning. Household. Households and firms as well, and uh, these are well. professional uh, analysts. You know, for, 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 for looking at the prices, I think it's important uh, the expectations of whom right. we're looking at. Yes. You know, I have all sorts of expectations, yeah. but, I, but the person who actually yeah. does uh, uh, the investments of my little saving right. is an expert. Yeah. So uh, yeah. my expectations don't really affect the prices. 
Well, I guess there's also a lot of work on mutual fund flows are very important for driving mutual fund allocation. So you need to put the money with the mutual fund manager to begin with for the manager to begin allocating. Um, so there's a lot of return chasing flows, which is if the mutual fund has done well in the past 12 months and households put a lot more money into it, and then it effectively the client's taste can but constrain the... expectations of the people who really make big decisions. Right. So let me get to that particular question, which is what are the expectations, whose expectations we care about. In the data, uh, what the different studies have covered include the following settings. Um, for example, um, in financial markets, stock returns, this is generally households. For bond yields and credit spreads, these are generally um, professional analysts in financial institutions like Goldman and so on. Um, who are very likely to trade these yeah. instruments. Yeah. Um, in macro outcomes, these are generally professional analysts um, in big financial institutions. For firms, it's the CFOs most likely, and they're, quite a, they're the direct decision makers for firms. For households, um, people have looked at house prices, how households directly buy houses. However, what you raised is a super important question for a lot of the modeling applications. For example, as I will uh, discuss later, one of the applications for bias expectations is to explain credit cycles. Um, so in this context, is it the same to model bias expectations for driving credit cycles versus bias expectations of driving fluctuations in stock market returns? Do we need uh, versus investment cycles? Um, when you start thinking about applications of biased expectations, uh, there in you will see that it's quite important to think about is it the investor who's biased, is it the manager who's biased, and who holds biased beliefs. And the current models generally assume that everyone is biased um, in the context of credit cycles, for example, in the context of stock returns. Some people are rational, some people are biased. So that's an important um, judgment, especially in the context of applications, whose beliefs also, you're trying to. One single homogeneous agent. Yes. Um, not necessarily. Sometimes you have rational agents and biased um, yeah. agents. S sometimes you don't. And so it, it, it is um, different applications have adopted different approaches, and I will mention those. I think those are very important questions to keep in mind in, in applications. Yes? Um, so all the evidence you showed us is average expectations? Yeah. You can also do versions of individual level of this. Okay, so my general question is if we see some phenomena in the average of expectations mm -hmm. of some sort of bias, yeah. why should we expect it to represent a bias on the individual level? Couldn't it be that all individuals are completely rational, but something like the aggregate makes it look like a bias? Yeah, you're anticipating one of the interesting elements of aggregation in terms of aggregating beliefs. I think it's in like two slides. But let me just say that for um, some of the exercise, you have aggregated some of the exercise, you have individual level data. For example, the credit spreads, you have individual level data. For the firm earnings, you have individual firm level data. So you can do the same exercise in individual level data. Depending on what predictor variable you use, Testing it in aggregated data versus testing it in individual data can give you same or opposite results. The trick is um, whether what you put into the regression is in the average person's information set or in everyone's information set. Maybe that's a little bit of a convoluted answer, um, but let me just say that for this exercise and this exercise, if you do it at the individual level, it's generally the same results. I'm not showing those tables because graphs are, are, are much um, easier to visualize and individual level exercises typically require tables that are more boring to read. Um, and the reason they work the same is the predictor variable, for example, firms past earnings um, and uh, actual credit spreads, you can plausibly think that they are in everyone's information set. So when, you, when the analyst forecast future credit spreads, everyone observe the current credit spread. So you're effectively using some, something that is in most people's information set. Similarly, if you do the exercise of predicting firms' future earnings using their current 
um, earnings. It's generally in their information set. In two slides, I will show a case where you can get different results using average beliefs versus individual level beliefs. If you would estimate an average individual forecast uh, individual to the state flag, mm -hmm. there's not a systematic bias in the they have a systematic bias. Like so do you mean that for each individual, some people are perennially optimistic, some people are perennially pessimistic? Bias. Um, so, yeah, uh, as you pointed out, there are two types of biases. One type of bias is perennial, it's constant type of bias. And another type of bias is more conditional. So there's unconditional bias and there's conditional bias. And what I've covered here is conditional bias, that conditioning on um, certain realizations of past shocks and past trends, you are more likely to have some type of bias. For the unconditional bias, it's more data set independent. I think in Yarda's talk, I wasn't there, but Yarda, for example, would show that in household forecasts like Michigan, there is unconditional bias, that households are probably on average too, optim uh, too pessimistic with respect to unemployment rate and think inflation is on average too high, something like that. So in some data sets, you do see um, unconditional bias. In other data sets, much less so. When you look at the firm's forecast of their earnings, it's on average pretty unbiased. When you look at financial analysts' forecasts of uh, macro and financial outcomes, it's more or less on average unbiased. So it's um, setting independent, more likely to find unconditional bias among households. Any other questions? So, well, yeah, one final uh, methodology I want to mention, which is related to the question that was just raised, um, would you expect to see different um, results at the individual level versus in the aggregate, which is something I will um, expand more on in the second half of uh, the lecture today. But suppose you adopt this methodology that you want to capture the information that people react to based on forecast revision that if you see that I revised up, it's generally an indication that I have received good news. And you can see if I overshoot, then my forecast errors will be predictably negative in the sense that I, my, I say something that's too high and realizations tend to be lower than what I say. Um, whereas if there's any reaction to this information that I've processed and incorporated in the forecast revision, then you may see uh, a positive uh, coefficient. If I revise up, I don't do it enough, and then there's uh, future realizations would be even higher. So if you take this approach to the data, for example, professional forecasters forecast of macro outcomes, and uh, you, s you test what this coefficient is, um, you generally find in many variables something like a negative coefficient, um, in the sense that when people revise up, they uh, seem to do it too much. Um, and therefore, future um, realizations tend to be lower than what they think, and vice versa. This works at the individual level because each person may be processing different information, and therefore, using forecast revision at the individual level captures what that particular individual is processing. We'll see this will lead to pretty different interpretation if you do it with average data. Um, and the final. Um, evidence uh, that you see. So you also see this type of behavior uh, in, in, in the field as well as in the simplest controlled experiments. Why do we want to run experiments? In part because in the field data there's, uh, there can be complications, for example, that you don't know people's information set, you don't know what information they're trying to process. And there are, can also be concerns of wh what is their incentive and what is, are, do they uh, try to minimize uh, forecast errors in the mean squared error sense. So you can put people in a much more controlled environment where you ask them to do the simplest form of forecasting exercise. Um, for example, in a recent e experiment, we asked people to make forecasts of the simplest type of process, AR1 processes. And uh, we have AR1 processes in different conditions with different levels of persistence, um, ranging from 0 to 1. And um, people start by observing 40 historical obser observations of this AR1 process. And in each round, they will make forecasts for time t plus 1, time t plus 2, um, proceed for 40 rounds. We've done this exercise with people from the US general population through MTurk, so like roughly 2,000 people from very diverse demographics, as well as 200 
MIT undergrads um, from electrical engineering and computer science. So um, across all these samples, we find a pretty consistent um, feature, which is if you want to describe what the, the structure of the forecast, it is a, the structure of the forecast, it has some loading on the rational expectations. You can measure this as either the full information rational expectations, which we know, um, or you can proxy it using in-sample um, rational expectations. And so on that note, one of the major advantage of um, a controlled experiment is you know the data generative process and what the rational expectation is supposed to be, uh, whereas you d it's very hard to know that in field data, even econometricians may not be able to estimate the data generative process um, very well. So here, so we can, we know at the actual shock and the impulse response to an actual shock in this simplest setting. And you see that it loads on the rational expectations, regardless of measurement of expect rational expectations. There's some path dependence, which I don't have time to go get into uh, in detail today, but there is some dependence on what you said in the, what you thought in the past. But um, the most uh, interesting element that I will uh, focus on now is across all the different settings, you see um, a stable overreaction to the most recent shock. So, um, for example, this plot shows the, the, uh, the path of the, the shock, which is this gray line. And if you have rational expectations, then rational expectations should move um, in, in this, along the path of this thin line, which is you incorporate the, the persistence of the shock and the go on. Um, if you look at the implied impulse response to a shock um, implied by the actual forecast, it tends to follow this dotted line, which is you see the impact to persist much more um, as implied by the actual forecast and converge gradually um, back to, uh, to the, um, the, the rational it's forecast. Like an impulse response. Yeah, this is an impulse response to a shock uh, with respect to the rational expectations and with respect to subjective expectations. Just want to yes. make sure I understand the uh -huh. experiment. The subject is given 40 data points and then makes a prediction about the next one that mm -hmm. is told what the actual yeah. outcome was yeah. and, and you go on yeah. for 40 rounds. Yes, okay. yes, correct. Yes. They are also told the row, right? They are not told the row because if you, well the entire um, exercise is to understand how people come up with the forecasting rule. If you uh, tell the row, then it becomes a calculation exercise. Uh, you, if you tell them the forecasting rule, then it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, it, it doesn't really uh, um, help. However, you can test whether giving them a linear prior of AR1 makes any difference. So that it's very hard to do with the general population to tell people um, from the general population what AR1 means. And that's why we had uh, 200 MIT students in ECS and they were required to take statistics classes. And for these MIT students, we randomized them into two groups. In one group, we tell them it's a, the process is generated um, by an AR1 with this form, a stable AR1 with this formula. Uh, and in the other group, you tell them it's generated by a random, um, stable random process, um, like what we tell the general population participant. Giving them an AR1 linear prior doesn't change the structure of the biases in the data. Um, so then you can ask, are there exceptions? I've shown several settings in the field data, in experimental data, where people have a tendency to um, uh, overproject the impact of recent shocks. Are there any exceptions to that? So there are, I think, three main categories of uh, settings where you see a slightly different picture. Um, one is when you look at short-term earnings forecast, there is evidence of um, sluggishness, of underreaction. For example, if you, again, use the, the methodology of predicting forecast errors with forecast revisions, in short-term analyst forecast, you find a positive coefficient instead of a negative coefficient. So when analysts revise up uh, about short-term earnings, they may not do it sufficiently. Um, and therefore, future realizations may be higher. At the same time, other research finds that if you look at analysts' long-term earnings growth forecasts, it's the, the reverse picture. Um, so somehow, so short-term 
forecast, short-term earnings forecasts have more inertia than forecasts of long-term outcomes. That's a pretty um, common phenomenon that you may see in the data that for forecasts of long-term outcomes, the, the, the impact of um, over-extrapolation tends to be more pronounced. And there's still um, some work trying to reconcile why people um, have um, different type of behavior with respect to short-term forecasts versus long-term forecasts. And with firms' short-term um, expectations, there's also some evidence um, or some signs of um, underreaction or sluggishness. Um, in firms, in the data of firms, you generally don't have the full term structure to test um, how forecast errors can be predicted by forecast revision. You see that in this case, you need two forecasts of the same realization xt plus 1 at two different points in time, so ft and ft minus 1. So, and therefore, that allows you to construct forecast revision. In, typical, um, in a typical uh, data set of firms forecasts, you don't have this term structure of forecast. And therefore, one methodology you can look at instead is whether there's autocorrelation in forecast errors, um, in particular for forecast errors of non-overlapping windows. Of course, if you do overlapping windows, it will be positively correlated. And some papers actually did that. So uh, don't uh, do that. But if you do non-overlapping windows, oftentimes you also find in short-term earnings forecast of firms some form of positive correlation. Um, one possibility, as Ben alluded to um, yesterday, is with organizations there may be some cost of adjustment. Um, for example, GM cannot inform its managers today that our earnings growth forecast is 5%, tomorrow is 6%, the day after it's 7%, and then 4%. So they need to use these forecasts to organize production and to coordinate among different groups. So maybe there are some institutional constraints in how how much and how often they can update. So that's just a one wild conjecture, but generally with short-term earnings forecasts, you may see some underreaction. Another type of setting where you may see underreaction is when you condition on shocks that it's not obvious that people take them into account. For example, Koibian and Gordon Schenkel have a, um, an interesting paper where they isolate technology shocks and news shocks using VAR. So you run some VARs, put on some restrictions to identify these shocks and see how these shocks predict forecast errors. And they show that, for example, when you detect some deflationary shocks, um, forecasts seem to underreact to it, meaning that when you see a def when a deflationary shock hits, uh, in the next period, the forecast error tends to be negative, meaning that people said that in that actual inflation is lower. There's more deflation than people thought, so they didn't fully incorporate deflationary shocks. However, these shocks, tech, technology shocks, news shocks, are somewhat nebulous, perhaps, and not sure if people actually process and attend to them in real time. So if you look at a shock that's not in people's information set, that people don't respond to, of course, naturally, you would find underreaction to those particular shocks. Um, so the overall picture is, seems to be that people have a general tendency to overreact to shocks that they pay attention to and they process, but of course they don't process everything. And the, so the things that are left over, you, if you condition on those things, you may see underreaction. And the there fun... There may yeah. be some project, there may be some interest in combining this kind of work to what, what Ben showed. Right, us, yeah. Right? Trying to understand yeah. why do people, what kind of... If, the yeah. The yeah. So that's an interesting area I don't think people have explored much, which is we know something about the biases in processing information that you do take into account. And Ben raises the question of what is the in type of information that people take into account. Can you nest these two steps in one setting? And that's a, an interesting question, I guess. Um, in that can be tested, I think, even in pretty simple experimental settings to begin with, which, where you can actually control the information that is given, that people do acquire, yeah. and um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm, I was thinking uh, on this line, the, the, um, the experiments that you had with the MIT students, mm -hmm. for example, um, were they given different times or different instruments to produce these forecasts, or always the same? Uh, 
They're the same, yeah. Okay. If we had 2,000 MIT undergrads, we could do more variations, but there's only, um, you know, out of 2,000 who were enrolled, we already captured 10% of them, which is pretty good. Um, but if there's more, then you, of course, can do more treatments and more, more cuts. The other universities. What? The other universities. Yeah. The other universities. Um, so the, f the final setting I want to mention is related to the question of whether we get the same um, results when you look at individual level behavior and consensus um, <coughs> forecasts. So if, inst if instead of doing this exercise at the individual level, you do it using the average forecast, then in the data you typically would see a positive coefficient for the average belief um, in contrast with the negative coefficient that you see in the individual data. And um, I want to just give a very brief explanation of the intuition and dig more into the, the way you generate this later which is suppose different people are responding to different information. You will detect that everyone may overreact to their own information, but they don't overreact to other people's information. And therefore, when you take a linear average of the belief and see whether they over or underreact to the average information, then you're putting, it, putting into this part a lot of information that the, the typical forecaster does not know, which is other people's information. Therefore, you can get a different picture. I'll return to this um, later. So then um, I want to discuss one class of models that have been motivated by the evidence on the tendency to over-extrapolate um, or overreact to recent trends and shocks. Um, this what Bordello and Oli Schieffer called diagnostic expectations. You'll see why uh, in a few slides. And initially a lot of this um, attempt of modeling is also inspired by other forms of um, biases that we see in people's judgment and they try to build a bridge between um, some other settings of heuristics and biases and probably probability judgment in the context of expectations formation. So the motivation is the general observation of representativeness that at least uh, dates back to Kahneman and Tversky uh, where they said that an attribute is representative of a class if it is very diagnostic, uh, meaning the relative frequency of this attribute is much higher in that class than in a relevant reference class. This is pretty abstract and we'll illustrate it with um, an example. So suppose you're trying to assess um, an attribute uh, T in a class G that's represented by, uh, by this notation. And the definition of representativeness would be how prevalent this characteristic is conditioning on this particular group you're focused on relative to the prevalence of this attribute in other groups where in general. For example, take the simplest example of hair color. Um, so suppose that there are three types of hair color, red, light, and dark. And there, uh, there's a group that you're trying to assess, which is Irish. Um, like if you're trying to answer the question, if someone is Irish, what's the probability that that person has red hair? And the, the, com the comparison group is the rest of the world. Um, and suppose that the hair color is distributed as uh, among Irish people, you have 10% people with red hair, 40 with light, and 50 with dark. So Irish people, um, most of them have dark hair, but uh, there is um, a a fraction that have red hair, whereas for the world, you have very few people with red hair and you have many people with dark hair and so on. And so the representativeness bias would um, lead to inflating the prevalence of red hair among the Irish because that's the most distinct distinctive attribute of Irish people. So 10% um, relative to 1% stands out um, and the other attributes don't stand out. So you tend to inflate the prevalence um, of red hair among Irish and form stereotype of Irish having red hair. Uh, note that the way that stereotype is measured, where representative is measured, uh, is typically through a ratio. So it's not a first difference, which is an interesting choice, um, but also connected to a lot of um, psychological evidence and evidence from economic decisions that people's perception um, tends to be 
um, influenced by ratio like Weber's law and so on. So the uh, 10 relative to 1, 10 times is pretty large. Uh, not this difference of 9%, it's the, the 10 times that's capturing the representativeness. So you see, um, so red hair is, is a, an attribute that is pretty distinctive of Irish people, and therefore you may have um, a, a tendency to inflate its relevance. So how do we adapt this to the case of expectations formation? The idea is in a dynamic environment, what you get is, um, is some news, and so then you try to assess the, the prevalence or the probability of each state after receiving this news relative to before receiving this news. And the states that have become more likely after receiving this news, analogous to red hair after conditioning on um, Irish, those states that stand out, people will overweight them. If you have a good news, uh, then the, the high realizations after this news becomes much more salient relative to without this piece of news. And let's just do it in the simplest setting where um, suppose you have the state of economy following an AR1 process. And after seeing um, the current state, we try to assess the probability distribution of future state in, in time t plus one. So that's the, the object we're trying to assess conditioning on the current state being omega t. And the idea is a future state is more representative if it has become more likely upon receiving the latest news. So you compare this, um, this object which is conditioning on the current news relative to the likelihood of the state conditioning on not receiving the current news, which is the, the past would persist, so that's rho times omega uh, t minus one. So the choice of the comparison group in this context is what would happen without receiving the news. You compare what has happened with the news to what would have happened without the news and then you inflate those states that have become more likely with, um, after receiving the latest news. So then the, um, the subjective distribution of the likelihood of each state um, is modeled as the objective distribution multiplied by this representativeness um, bias scaled by theta, uh, where theta captures the degree of representativeness bias were the degree of diagnosticity, um, and then you normalize it so it integrates to one. So that's the characterization of the subjective uh, density distribution. And then you can also evaluate the, uh, the mean, um, the average expectation is, as the integral of, um, over the different states. So this nest rational expectations is a special case, obviously. If, if this parameter theta is zero, then you're back to rational expectations. It also nests ras rational expectations when there's no news. And that's something we'll revisit and see whether um, no news is corresp always corresponds to rational expectations in the data. Yes? No, theta is zero is rational because then you're just back to the objective distribution. If it's one, then you inflate it by exactly this ratio. If it's two, then you inflate it by this ratio squared. But you're the news. Sorry? You're the news. Yeah, so this is already the rational density accounting for the news. So this is already conditioning on the current state with the news. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, right, and this is something that Mac always says to is that there's no T of uh, next to the row, right? So the, the model itself is, is, is constant. Is it possible that. There's no T next to the row? Exactly. Uh, you want to. No, I don't want to do anything. I'm just saying, so if, if the model itself is, mm -hmm. is, is true and it's constant, right, and it's out there. And so I wonder if part of sort of these biases and problems with expectations would also go back to the idea that there actually is. Mm -hmm. We disagree on, on row itself and yeah. 
Yeah. So I will mention two classes of models related to what you said at the end as alternative approaches. One is um, just a me mechanical um, w idea that you may think that the row is higher than what the true row is. And like people think things are more persistent than they are. Um, another idea is you perpetually try to learn some parameters of the process. For example, um, in the work of uh, Stefan Nagel's recent work on um, uh, constant gain learning. Um, but in those cases, you tend to have overreaction if you combine that with some, where implicitly you embedded in one way or another some form of effective what they call fading memory that you weigh pa past information too little in your pursuit to learn the true parameter. Um, so then you can characterize that if the, the underlying process is AR1 and the shocks are normal, then the uh, posterior dis distribution um, uh, is also normal, both the objective one and the subjective one, with the same conditional variance. Um, and the mean would be the rational expectations plus a distortion. And what's this distortion? It's the parameter theta, which captures the degree of bias times uh, what, what this is, is just the effective change in the rational ex expectation, where you can write it as rho times uh, the, the recent shock, uh, which is, they are the same. So you take the recent shock and multiply it by rho and the degree of bias. And that's the compo composite bias um, with a, a given shock. And therefore, you can also see pretty, in a pretty straightforward way in this, if people um, form expectations along this type, uh, along this line, then forecast errors are predictable. So the forecast errors, uh, the predictable forecast error is just this term, which is um, rho theta times epsilon t. Um, you, so you can see the bias in the uh, average expectation or the, the, um, the expectation on average. You can also characterize the full posterior distribution. So this is, this very thin dotted line is supposed to represent the prior. And if you have rational expectations upon receiving a news, um, then you move in this direction by this much. Um, however, if you have this bias, then you move too much. So you, instead of moving to this middle distribution, you move too much to the direction of the news. Um, in trying to capture this entire posterior distribution, one observation is you have bias in terms of the average, the expectation on average, but you may also deliver things like neglect of tail risk. For example, outcomes worse than this line would have this, t this uh, entire area if you have rational expectations, but only a very small area if you have um, distorted expectations. So that connects a little bit to Jose's question, can you deliver effective overconfidence because in, can you potentially connect effective overconfidence and some form of overreaction? Um, so I haven't fully thought this through, but one possibility is um, when you receive a good shock, then you, you give confidence intervals that are, to, that are off the center, that are centered in the wrong place. And it, it's plausible that in that case, you, you may get the result that you hit the confidence interval too, too, too little uh, compared to the, the true, um, if you have, so if you don't have the average bias. Then you have to think about what the average bias yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You have to disagree if that, for that to be true, yeah. you have to be also disagreeing on what the average returns would be. You don't have to disagree. You just and need to have a conditional bias in the average. Yeah, yeah. What the average return yeah. would be. Yeah. You don't have to disagree. You just need to have a conditional right. bias. Yeah. And that can also lead to hitting the confidence interval too little, potentially. Potentially yeah. make the, yeah. the, 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 the Yeah. So one issue in terms but of resolving really those. Just look at the data and see how, uh, how wide these conditional intervals are, right? Yeah. In your case, you hit it too little because you hit yeah. to the left or to the right. Right. 
Yeah, you would hit it. Just compute the, yeah. the conditional interval compare. Yeah. So you so see the, 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 the average conditional interval. Right. Is yeah. Too, too narrow. Yeah. So in this world, you would hit the interval too little, but the width of the interval yeah, should be the same as. So uh, if you try to estimate the degree of bias across different people, are there characteristics that are associated with the degree of bias? Does the experience reduce bias? Um, so I don't know much of the scope in terms of estimating this model per se, but I can speak in general. For example, if you run the experiment that we did and you can measure the degree of bias across like pretty wide demographics and you can ask whether this coefficient for example varies with any demographic attributes. Um, so far we haven't found reliable predictors in terms of explaining this overreaction bias in, in general. Um, if you want to estimate the bias more specific to that particular model and ask if there's um, demographic predictors of that um, I don't know what the result would be, but in general, in my current experience, I haven't seen pro uh, strong predict uh, predictive power of demographics. But the point but you raise yeah. is an interesting yeah. one, and it, it may very well be true, but this has, if you want to be very fancy, this has a Nietzschean characteristic, or if you want to make it appeal to popular culture, it's like grandpa today. Everything yeah. starts again, you forget that you made your mistakes, you know the movie, Day. This Groundhog actually doesn't, it doesn't, it's yeah. not Groundhog Day, the, the, yes, diagnostic expectation, the way it's, this is formulated, it has Groundhog Day. It can be fixed uh, with a simple twist, which, but maybe, um, the, the simple, but maybe a little too naive, which is you can change the base group. If you change the base group instead of what, what, what happened based on last period, you change it like to T, like minus H. Yeah. Then you yeah, refresh yeah. every H period every so H as H opposed H to every one period. Yeah. Um, so let's yeah. So on that note, let's talk about some of the properties of this formulation. One is it. it I think a lot of the hope is to nest rational expectations as a special case, and you so so that this model is very portable. Um, and you would see that it converges to rational expectations if the f one of the following condition holds. If, the th if you don't have bias, of course, if there's no news, then this term disappears, or if the persistence is zero, um, so that there's a, a no um, surprise based on rational expectations. That's not typically what you find in the data. So in the data, if you, like for example, you do the experiment where the row is zero, people do overreact in that case. It's not that when you reduce the persistence, then overreaction disappears. And in fact, if you um, estimate this model in the data across conditions with different levels of persistence, you would find that diagnostic expectations, the way it's currently specified, predicts too little overreaction or extrapolation in cases where um, persistence is low. So the data looks more like something that instead of it's rho theta times the shock, it's more like theta times the shock instead of rho theta times the shock. Um, and then an, another important feature, which oh, um, you say that it doesn't really depend on the row. I know that it happens for row equal to zero, but yeah. it's really independent of the row. You get more or less the same. So that's what we found in the in data, your, except your with a, yeah, when, uh, with it some side twist. Yeah. Yeah. Like four, six, right. Uh, yeah. So what's your conjecture about that? What a type of world world it would be. Yeah. Um, Do you have any idea? Cause the coefficient to be in the bay, to be data, to say it's the Yeah. So it, if anything, it's slightly more when rho is low, um, not by the by a large margin, but slightly more when the rho is low. So yeah. So it is. Like, if you want to deliver that, then there may be some elements of people um, are used to some level of persistence from life, and 
Therefore, um, when persistence is really low, then you have much more scope for over extrapolation. When something is already very persistent, you have some scope, but much less so. Um, that's one thing that I've thought about, but I haven't thought a lot about how to interpret the consistent, so the, the, the fact that it's in the data it's more like theta times the, the shock. Um, so another property that is um, the authors often highlight is the property of so-called kernel of truth. What does that mean? It means that the, when you characterize the subjective belief, it's not totally detached from rational belief. There's some connection to the rational belief. So for example, if you put people in conditions where um, the, the process is ID versus the, when the process is a random walk, people don't give you the same type of um, forecast. So people do adapt to the setting. They do incorporate um, some features of the environment that ID processes are less persistent than random walks. But they don't fully um, do it the exact right way. And in particular, you try to incorporate some, some elements of truth, but you exaggerate certain elements of truth. Um, and that ad ad adaptation to the setting is sometimes called forward looking. And this connects to um, the, the initial um, Lucas critique issue, um, which is um, in, for the old generations of um, behavioral models, oftentimes it's sort of like a speci they specify a mechanical dependence on the past. And Lucas says, so, well, people do not, um, do not think about the future in a mechanical way. They do adapt if you tell them that the regime has shifted and so on. So this forward-looking term is related to that. It's much easier to test forward-lookingness um, in the cross-sectional sense. Um, however, you can also think about testing the forward-lookingness by, say, like announcing that today the world has changed and the process has changed, and you would see that people adapt somewhat. So in, in both cases, um, the idea is because subjective expectation incorporates some elements of the true process, the true setting, therefore it's not mechanical and not necessarily have to be subject to Lucas' critique. Um, so you, you get to the right... Uh, you get to the right neighborhood, but not the right address, uh, and you probably walk too far um, in the direction of the recent shock. And you, w you also saw that um, the, in terms of characterizing the distribution uh, of subjective belief, you just have a parallel shift. There is no change in the, um, the conditional uh, variance. They it, don't get overconfidence in the, sen in the sense of um, thinking that the confidence interval is too narrow um, from this type of um, yes. modeling. Um, and so as Jose said, in the baseline specification, which is what's typically applied, um, you refresh every period, um, but that doesn't have to be the case if you, if you twist the, the, baseline, uh, the baseline group or the comparison group. Um, one question is what the theta is. Um, and whether it varies across settings, whether it varies across people. So there have been multiple attempts to have a sense of how large theta is in different um, applications in different settings. Um, so in, in the case of studying credit spreads forecasts, um, they estimate, which is the initial paper that uh, used this model, they estimate theta of about one. And then in other settings, you get something close between 0.5 and one. Um, it is, I think, still sort of an open question whether this is a biological constant or it's something that is dependent on characteristics. And I want to um, end by just showing one application of this type of uh, model and the original application where they developed this approach. So um, the central observation relevant for this application is with this type of diagnostic expectations, you get what's called non-fundamental reversals. Um, so you can see this pretty easily. If the fundamental productivity is AR1, then there is predictable reversals in expectations, meaning that from an objective point of view, if you look at the, the revision in expectations from time t to time t plus 1, 
that is predictable. Note that in this um, setting, the, there's the law of iterated expectations holds with, with respect to subjective beliefs. It doesn't, of course, the revision is predictable based on the objective um, belief. So what's the predictability? You can see that, so you expand this into um, rho epsilon, uh, uh, omega t plus one and so on and the things cancel out and you're left with uh, this term. Where does it come from? It comes from the fact that your current expectation overreacts to the most recent shock and multiplied by rho squared because you're trying to forecast t plus two. This, re this most recent shock doesn't affect your, the, this shock at time t doesn't bias your expectation at t uh, plus one, Groundhog Day, t plus one is biased by epsilon t plus one. So in expectation, you would see this reversal, you overreact to what has happened today and tomorrow that, it's dis that disappears. So today, um, um, something causes us to be um, happy and tomorrow we forget it. And, and so then you become predictably sad relative to t today, um, tomorrow. So that's the, the, just the s simple mechanics of getting fundamental reversals. Um, in this context. And then um, they do this application in the context, in the context of uh, thinking about credit spreads. So the environment is pretty simple. You have long-lived risk-neutral households. They lend to firms, firms invest. Everyone is subject to bias expectations, both the firms and the households or, or the investors, the lenders. Um, in fact, in this particular model, the outcome of realization is binary, so there is no capture structure effectively to it. Uh, that is the same as equity, um, so, but, but the interpretation is, is dead within credit cycles. And then they, uh, they have set up the model in a way that the outcomes are linear in expectations, uh, or approximately linear to the first order, uh, so the credit spread is decreasing in the expectations of the fundamental shock. When you expect good shock, credit spread is low. Um, investment uh, is increasing in, sorry, this is the wrong sign, is increasing in, in, in the expectation of the shock. And therefore, you can see that the non-fundamental reversal in expectations because of this linear relationship just directly translates into the non-fundamental reversals in outcomes. Um, and you can, uh, you can derive that in this very simple world, uh, the outcomes follow, have the following law of motion. Um, credit spread is this and investment is this. Um, so for example, take credit spreads. If there's no bias, then it's just a pretty simple R1 process. Uh, when there is bias, then what, what is going on? Uh, well, there's non-fundamental reversal with respect to yesterday's shock. If yesterday there's a positive shock, then then there's a non-fundamental uh, reversal of an increase in spread today. There's also an overreaction to t today's shock. So if today there's a positive shock, then the spread is low. And vice versa for investment. So we, um, we would see overreact to current news and reversal to past news. And therefore, you get these predictable cycles in prices and quantities. Um, one question is, what is the right time horizon for thinking about these reversals. Um, in the model, there's really like, it's kind of uh, horizonless. You can think about this as a day, you can think about it as a month, you can think about it one year, five years. It's the same mechanics, uh, except that the role would of course change if you try to estimate things based on the data. But the mechanics wouldn't. Whereas when we think about things like credit cycles, they're generally uh, long lasting um, events. Uh, and they don't revert. Uh, over on a daily or monthly period. So the model is not uh, very active on that front in thinking about the, the path dependence of credit shocks. Um, that's connected to one of the things I will discuss later, which is when you apply these biases to um, particular settings, then what are some of the um, additional features that are um, important for a particular setting that we, you, you may want to combine with the model. Um, and then finally, I want to just uh, mention um, two alternative or three alternative approaches related to the question from before. Um, one approach that 
in, you see in some asset pricing papers and uh, is you just model pure extrapolation in, in a backward looking sense in the, in the, by which we mean that there is no dependence in how subjective expectations formed um, based on the properties of the true process. You just specify it as what has the current state plus a distortion based on what has happened in the past. And the, so this doesn't have the so-called kernel of truth property. It doesn't really specify dependence on the particular setting. And therefore, the one issue with it is um, so this theta is kind of arbitrary and you may need to change the level of theta in different settings to fit um, the data. So it's kind of an arbit arbitrary uh, way to specify biases. And then there's another way which some papers adopt, which is to just say, oh, people overestimate the persistence of the true process. Um, that is actually operationally often not that different from diagnostic expectations. You see that diagnostic expectation is to exaggerate the most recent shock. If you do this and you ex exaggerate every shock in every period uh, in an exponentially uh, de declining, with exponentially declining weight. Um, so, and you would also get the non-fundamental reversal in this case as well because you over extrapolate today's shock. Uh, so today you over extrapolate today's shock a lot. Tomorrow you over extrapolate today's shock much less. And so you would get non-fundamental reversal even with this particular, uh, this other formulation as well. Uh, but still one question is if you specify it this way, um, that, that we just think that life is more persistent than th it actually is. Um, there's a, re a remaining question, which is how much is the difference and what characterizes the difference between the subjective perception of persistence and the actual persistence. Um, and then finally, there is a, a set of pretty interesting work that's still being developed, which, which is related to people trying to figure out something and then they try to recall information from memory um, and they may overweight recent um, events in this um, effort because it's easier to recall or you just specified in an exogenous way. Um, in a particular asset pricing application, you can see the recent paper of Stefan Nagel and, um, and, and, uh, and his co-author. And there is also pretty interesting work that Mike Woodford is developing. He doesn't have a full draft posted yet, so I don't fully understand the me mechanics that he's trying to um, develop. But the broad idea is you have noisy memory and you remember recent things much more than uh, things in the past. And therefore, you may have a tendency to overweight um, recent events. And he seems to do it in a way that's actually, in terms of methodology, connected to rational inattention. So that's also a potential venue for bridging, thinking about the underlying foundations of uh, inattention and imperfect information processing and, um, for example, bias reaction to information in this context. But these are really interesting um, works still um, in, in progress and you can follow these authors if you're interested. Um, and on that note, um, I, I um, asked Elhanan yesterday if I can shorten the break to 15 minutes because I have a flight to catch at 4.30 and I recently have had traumatic experiences <laughs> catching flights and by extrapolating um, from my recent experience and also these memories are really fresh on top of my mind. So um, I'm very scared and I want to make sure I can uh, get to the so next should, flight. Should they get the everybody get back? So I guess uh, that uh, clock is a little bit on. Um, yeah, a, a quarter to, uh, quarter to 11. 11. And uh, any questions for this first half of the, yes? Um, I was wondering, so in terms of these extrapolation models, or these specification models, like one thing that I kind of found always confusing is do we extrapolate based on kind of changes to growth, right? So changes, is it the levels of growth? Mm -hmm. And is the diagnostic expectation kind of like a probability? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that actually connects to a much broader question, which is what's the right, uh, as you said, what's the right space of um, extrapolating a, like one particular manifestation of this is growth versus levels. 
um, because like it's pretty obvious if you estimate growth versus levels, the row would be different, and the the overreaction is scaled by rho, so therefore it, it has to make a difference. Um, but it, some other manifestations of what's the right space is, for example, do you have bias beliefs of the fundamental at the level of TIP shocks, or you have bias expectation at the level of earnings, or you have it at the level of returns? Some of that I would discuss in the second half of today. But that's, that's sort of a judgment call when you uh, are in a particular application, I think. Um, oftentimes, people do find it convenient to um, apply the biases to like f the most fundamental fundamentals, like TIP, and then therefore you can derive everything based on that. But that may not generate some features of the data, for example, return extrapolation that I will mention later. Yes? Yeah. Oh, it's a, they have the same problem, I think, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 So, um, Two points based on that. One is if you really want to capture um, features of the expectations data and so on, for example, your question of earnings, uh, sorry, level versus growth, I think it's probably most, um, it, it's probably best to look at the, the type of unit that people generally process. Like no one thinks about GDP in, in terms of levels. It's about GDP growth and therefore um, GDP growth is the more relevant object. However, why you see a lot of work on, on TIP shocks, because there are many moving elements in the economy, like inflation and GDP. Um, if you model biases at the level of perception of TIP shock, then you can derive um, bias expectations of all outcomes together. Whereas if you apply one rule for GDP and one rule for inflation, when these things are connected, then it becomes somewhat messy. However, as you saw, if you take it literally in the data, and try to m measure TF, literal TIP shocks and how expectations data react to TIP shocks, you may not see the same type of behavior when you apply, when you test the data um, on forecasts of GDP growth. So I think it's a little bit of a trade-off in terms of um, empirical realism and, and modeling convenience and coherence in this case. Yes. Yeah, so that's related to some of the things I want to discuss in the second half. Uh, you can test uh, various aspects of, you can try to ask questions about various aspects of do these biases matter, and you will see that in that exercise it's much more model dependent. Um, and I will explain some aspects of how it's model dependent. And also, as I alluded to before, um, which we'll revisit in the second half as well, um, for example, if you want to generate fluctuations, do you think it's because firms bias that managers over extrapolate or because like, you want to capture things like credit cycles because lenders over extrapolate? S um, they could have different implications for some questions that you think about. So there are actually several papers that are trying to work um, in, 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 in those directions, um, but they do need to make the judgment call, which is which, what, what is the type of um, environment that is of interest. Okay, I guess then we can start the break. <laughs>